From there, I moved into venture capital and uh, worked for many years for an early stage uh, fund investing in technology-based businesses, which is a, a tough game, I have to say, trying to spot winners at the, at the very earliest uh, stages of developing ideas. Uh, from there, uh, I left and, and set up a couple of companies myself, uh, doing sort of various things, sort of medical devices and um, uh, in the music industry as well, actually. One, one of the companies uh, was a consulting organization that ran business startup programs for the Welsh Development Agency. Um, sold out of that uh, about 10 years ago, and since then I've been doing a portfolio of things, really. So working with some private clients on corporate finance, um, uh, working with the, the Welsh Government, uh, advising early stage, particularly technology companies. Um, and latterly, I've sort of got back into sort of structured business startup programs. So we actually run a program for the Welsh Government called the High Potential Startup Program. Um, essentially, we're trying to identify early stage, primarily technology-based businesses that have the potential to really grow very quickly within a two to three year period. Um, so we, we help those kind of businesses with funding, with strategy, um, you know, with the deployment of their business model. Um, so that's my background. Um, there's a couple of things that I just want to mention before we get stuck into the, to the actual presentation itself. Um, the, the first is the High Potential Program. If anybody's interested in that, then have a chat with me afterwards. And I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to outline what we can do on the program. The second is to say clearly this morning we've only got an hour slot. Um, and as Seamus said, we want to take some questions from the floor. So I'm not going to be able to sort of dive into lots of detail on this. This is going to be very much an overview of the business finance landscape. So what I'm trying to do this morning is take a helicopter view of the business finance landscape. What are the main types of business finance? That's the first issue we want to cover off, understanding the main types of business finance. And then what are the main sources of business finance? And try and think a little bit about what different finance providers are, are looking for. So, so the second plug, if you like, apart from the High Potential Programme, is that we actually deliver a series of workshops for the Welsh Government called Accessing Business Finance. Um, if you Google um, Accessing Business Finance and Welsh Government, or indeed look at the Welsh Government's new uh, Business Wales website, you can uh, find out more about these workshops, half-day workshops, two separate workshops, one on Accessing Business Finance, general overview, and one on uh, Raising Venture Capital. Um, if you are interested in exploring some of the themes that we're going to talk about this morning in a bit more detail and thinking more about different sources of funding, then uh, you can come along to those half-day workshops. Uh, they are free. Um, OK. So in time-honored fashion, and to get a bit of interaction going, um, as a consultant, uh, borrow your watch to tell you the time, I'm going to throw this open to you. So I'm going to ask you, what are the main places that businesses get money from? Banks, excellent. The B word already. OK. And what do we get from banks? <sighs> grief, yeah. OK. Apart from grief, a loan. So a term loan. OK. Yeah, good. Nothing. OK. Confidential in invoice discounting or, or factoring. Yeah. Sorry? Generally not, not from your main high street banks. They're not especially interested in buying shares in small companies. So th th there are, you know, most of the big banks. Yeah. OK, so, so, so most of the big banks will have a venture capital arm, uh, but that's distinct from the main high street sort of lending, if you like. OK? Mortgage. A mortgage, yeah, which is kind of a term loan backed by an asset, often a property. Yeah. Overdraft, yeah. Uh, less popular these days, especially amongst the banks. Anything else? And we're not just thinking about banks now, so any kind of money that can be raised for business? A credit card, okay. Okay, credit cards, yeah, well, we'll put it down. Very, very short term. Okay, and exp customers. customers, yeah, okay, good. Friends and family. Friends and family, we're, we're getting there, yeah. Business angels, yeah. Okay. Venture capitalists, yeah. Sorry? Crowdfunding, yes, good. We're going to talk about a lot of these things in a minute. Crowdfunding, yeah. Grants, the G word, okay. Grants. 
Credit from suppliers, yeah, excellent. Uh, what, what do you mean by match funding? Okay, so your own money, yeah, okay. A any others? I think we've captured a lot of them, but. High purchase, HP, yeah. So asset finance of one sort or another, high purchase, leasing, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, I mean, already we've got quite a long list there. Um, quite a different number of sources. Um, and all operating in a slightly different way. But in the interest of, of clarity and, and bringing some um, focus to what we're trying to do today, I would say that... Missing a slide there, but we'll <coughs> skip over that. All forms of funding fall into basically three criteria, three types rather, borrowing, equity, or grants. And you can put all of these into one of those three boxes, basically, borrowing, equity, or grants. And uh, uh, some of you may have noticed that if you take the uh, first letter of each of those, they, they give you the acronym, acronym BEG. So, so one way of, of remembering that. But essentially, that, that's how um, uh, money to businesses works. You know, I can either lend it to you, I can invest it in you, or I can give it to you. Um, and that's really the only three ways that, that, that money is going to get into a business, um, unless it's generating uh, profits itself. But in a sense, that's the type of equity anyway. Um, and I think one of the issues, one of the, 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 the problems that a lot of entrepreneurs face is they actually mix these things up. So they think that, you know, well, I can't get a bank loan, so I'll go to that venture capitalist and he'll give me the money instead. Or I can't get some venture capital, so I'll go and get a dirty great big bank loan. But the reality is that these different forms of finance, although there are some grey areas, they are very different to one another. So somebody who's lending money to a company has a quite a different perspective to somebody who is investing money in a company. In turn, probably has quite a different perspective uh, to a civil servant, typically, who is looking to give grant money to a company. They have different mindsets, different perspectives, and they're not simply interchangeable. Now, they can work together, and they complement each other very well. So if you're raising equity finance, that might give you the capacity to leverage some debt finance. But, you know, an equity proposal is not necessarily completely interchangeable with a debt proposal. So let's explore those themes in a little bit more detail. So borrowing. Okay, so borrowing is characterised by the following. The loan capital is repaid to an agreed schedule. Everybody understands that. Um, interest is paid at an agreed rate. Um, fees and charges, security. Um, and, and the key thing really, from a, from, particularly from a banking point of view, now this morning I'm going to use banks as a, 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 as a catch-all for lending um, uh, because it's useful in, in terms of thinking about how lending works. But there are other forms of lending. But one of the key things from a banking point of view is I have a fixed or limited upside. So if I lend £1,000 to a company and I charge them £100 in interest, it doesn't matter how well that business does, I get my £1,000 back plus my £100 in interest. And you find this with a lot of entrepreneurs. They'll go to a bank and they'll say, this business is going to make a million pounds. And the bank manager says, great, I'm very happy for you. What do I get back? My £1,000 and my £100. Uh, interest. My upside is, is limited. So if my upside is limited, I need to be very careful about managing the potential downside. So I'm very interested in where the risks are and in avoiding those risks. And if there are risks, then I'm interested in that issue there, security. Because I'm you know, lending at relatively narrow margins. My upside is limited. So, you know, I need to have protection in the event, or generally speaking, I need to have protection in the event that uh, the company is unable to, to repay the money that I've lent them. So that's a very different mindset to, to, to an equity investor. So wh wh where does this lead us? All of this basically means that a lender is primarily interested in two key questions. Now, sure, there are lots of sub-questions to this, but they're interested in two key questions. Can the business generate sufficient cash to pay back the interest and capital? That's my number one issue. Can they service the debt? Um, so I need to see consistent cash flow with enough headroom in it to be absolutely confident that they're going to be able to repay that debt. And secondly, 
if it all goes horribly wrong, what security do I have? So is there an asset against which I can recover some of my losses, etc.? cetera? Um, and this is one of the fundamental disconnects between entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurial mindset and the banking mindset, if you like, and we've heard some of this this morning. You know, how many entrepreneurs do you know have been to a bank and said, um, well, I've got a fairly average idea, um, and it'll probably limp along for the next two to three years and then go spectacularly bust? You know, on entrepreneurs don't say that. They go to the bank believing that their idea is the best thing since sliced bread. The trouble is, from a bank's point of view, They've seen hundreds of businesses. They've heard all that before. Um, and they know that statistically, only one in three startup businesses will survive more than five years. Now, that being the case, then they're cautious people. Yeah, sure, they'll lend you the money, but only if you can convince them that you can repay it. Um, and if it all goes horribly wrong, they're covered. So banking is, is, should be, you know, most mainstream banking is a fairly boring business, really. It's about you know, lending money against future cash flows backed by some sort of security by way of assets. OK, so some boring examples, and we picked up most of these. We've got you know, overdraft. I have to say, banks are increasingly reluctant to give businesses overdrafts. You know, they would much rather find other forms of finance that that are appropriate. And there are various reasons for that. Won't go into that now, but overdraft finance is, is, is trickier these days than it was a few years ago, a, a term loan. Um, again, actually, a lot of banks are not giving out long-term loans at the moment. You know, they haven't got the cash to invest themselves. And what's going to happen in five years' time? Who can tell? So term loans are tricky from banks at the moment. Um, invoice discounting or, or factoring, that's effectively where you you sell something to your customers, generally a, a, a B2B transaction, a business customer. They owe you a thousand pounds, and they're going to pay you in 45 days. Great, but you haven't got any cash now. So effectively, what you do is you sell that invoice to a, to a factoring company, and they'll give you the money up front. And then when the company does pay, you, you pay the, the factoring company back. That is an increasingly popular form of working capital funding in banks. And banks quite like invoice discounting. Um, they make more money on it than they do on an overdraft, but, but it also allows them to keep better eye on, on how the business is performing and, and have a, a clear idea of, um, of, uh, of the security position that they have. Um, asset finance, uh, HP leasing, and so on. I mean, effectively, what you're doing with, with, with asset finance is you're acquiring an asset, you're borrowing money secured against that asset, and you repay it over a given period of time. You may end up owning it at the end or giving it back, depending on the precise nature of the relationship. Credit from suppliers, mentioned by someone earlier. Important uh, form of finance, really short-term borrowing, effectively, for a lot of companies, getting credit from your suppliers. And negotiating those terms is, can be crucial, particularly in a startup phase. Upfront payment from customers. Um, you have to be careful if you're getting upfront payments from, from Joe Public. Um, there are all sorts of rules as to how you handle that money. But yeah, if you can negotiate it, um, you know, you're supplying a product or a service, a deposit of 10 or 15%, that can make all the difference between struggling cash flow wise and actually making it work. Directors, shareholders, loan. Um, you know, a lot of directors or, and shareholders will, will lend money to their, to their own companies. How many charge interest? Nothing stopping you charging interest on loans that you, you, you put into your own company. How many directors and shareholders take security in their own business? Nothing stopping you doing that. And in fact, you'd be advised to do that. Um, the Enterprise Finance Guarantee Scheme. Anybody come across this? A couple of hands in the room. Yeah, OK. In theory, a very good scheme. Essentially, <laughs> um, what happens with the Enterprise Finance Guarantee Scheme is that, you know, back to the two questions that banks ask, can this business um, cash flow the, 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 the uh, repayment schedule, tick, yes, I think they can. Uh, second question, what if it all goes horribly wrong? Is there any security? Ah, got a problem. If that is the case, then this is where potentially the Enterprise Finance Gu Guarantee Scheme can, uh, can come in. So essentially what will happen is that 
you will apply to the bank for funding under the Enterprise Finance Guarantee Scheme and the government will guarantee 75% of, of the loan. It's, in it's, it's operated through the banks. The banks have the um, uh, final decision on whether or not they lend the money, um, but it is a way of unlocking a scenario where you have insufficient security in the business or in your own you know, personal assets to provide security for the bank. You do need to shop around with it. Um, some, some banks are more in favor it than, than others. Um, there's a really good website. If you Google EFGS, you'll find their website in, uh, in Sheffield. Lots of information there on eligible sectors. Also, a list of the organizations that provide EFGS money. And it's not just the main high street banks. So there are all sorts of other organizations. For example, in this area, uh, uh, British Steel Industry, UK Steel Industry, um, operating the former uh, steel areas of Wales, they operate the Enterprise Finance Guarantee Scheme. Um, a factoring company called Venture Finance, they operate the Enterprise Finance Guarantee Scheme. So there are lots of options that, are, that fall outside the main high street banks. Uh, crowdsourcing, uh, mentioned by someone this morning, an emerging area. Um, there are a number of crowdsourcing websites. Again, if you Google crowdsourcing, you'll get dozens of them. Uh, they include uh, companies like Crowdcube. And actually, I think the chief executive of Crowdcube is giving a, a talk here today. Um, there is the Funding Circle. Uh, there is uh, Kickstarter. The basic principle of all uh, crowdsourcing is that you use the internet as, a, as an intermediary, if you like, to put together people who are looking to raise money with people who have money to invest. Um, and essentially, uh, you, you post your business plan online, um, and people bid to, to lend money to your, your company, or occasionally invest money in your company. It's a new emerging area. Um, it's growing very quickly. Um, and th there are funds to invest, because clearly, people who, who've got some money to lend to companies you know, haven't got a lot of choices in terms of getting return on investment. You know, interest rates are so low, the stock market's all over the place. Who's going to want to buy Greek bonds? Um, you know, so, so people have money to invest, where can they put it? And one of the things that they can do is use the crowdsourcing websites to put small amount, relatively small amounts of money um, across a whole portfolio of companies who are looking to raise finance. So if I'm looking to raise £100,000, instead of going to the bank to raise a, you know, a 100 k term loan, I go to a crowdsourcing website and I raise £1,000 from 100 people. And that's the basic principle of it. They all work in slightly different ways. They all have slightly different business models. You will need to check it out. But it is a fast emerging source of, uh, of funding for, for um, startup and early stage companies in particular, and, and in fact, um, established businesses as well. Um, banks. Banks are still providing funding. They still are the biggest single source of funding for businesses in, in, in Britain. Uh, but they've tightened their criteria. There's no point in trying to deny that reality. Um, they're not operating as they were five years ago, and some people might say that's a pretty good thing, really. Um, one thing I would say is, again, shop around. If you go to the British Bankers Association website, which is, uh, the address is on there, there's 200 members of that. I bet there's not many people in this room that, that would you know, be able to name 200 banks in the UK. There's more than the, 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 the main high street banks. And a lot of these banks are specializing in particular areas of activity. So with, you know, that might be invoice discounting and factoring, or it might be um, you know, lending against certain assets. I know one um, small privately owned bank in London. They specialize in two, two areas of lending. They, they uh, lend money to people to buy Steinway pianos and to buy powerboats. Now that's. I don't know how you're going to get a Steinway piano on a power, but that, that could happen, I guess. But you know, that, that's an indication of, of a smaller bank specializing in different areas. Why do they do that? Because it means they understand the market for Steinway pianos and power boats. And if something does go horribly wrong, as we've talked about, they've probably got a way of turning that asset into cash again. Um, and there are all sorts of other um, organizations that specialize in different areas of, of activity. So you know, a message from today is, shop around. The other message is you're going to have to do your homework, certainly on the Enterprise Finance Guarantee Scheme, certainly on crowdsourcing, and definitely on banking. There are no shortcuts here. 
Um, you can take professional advice, and there are many really good corporate finance advisors out there who will help you to put together a funding package. It's not an easy thing to do, and it is very time-consuming. And as I'm sure most of you know, you should not underestimate how long it can take to do that. So um, shop around and, uh, and utilize the information that's available to you. OK, moving on to equity now. So uh, share capital, uh, investment in a company, um, is characterized by the following things. The funds are completely at risk. Uh, so if the business go, goes bust, I lose all my money. I've got no security, or generally speaking. Um, and uh, in terms of a liquidation, I'm at the bottom of the pile. When the money gets uh, divvied out, you know, almost certainly I'll, I'll get nothing as a shareholder. Um, but, but, to compensate for the risk, I do share in the upside potential. So remember we talked earlier about the fact that if you go to a bank and you tell them that you're going to make a million, the bank says, fine and dandy, but I'm going to get my loan and my interest back. So I'm actually not that specially interested in that. But that is exactly what a VC is interested in because that's where they make their money. They kiss a lot of frogs and hopefully... Some of them will turn into Prince Charming or Sleeping Beauty or whatever it happens to be. And there is also the opportunity to influence the company management. Um, so if I'm a shareholder in a business, I probably have more direct interest in how that business operates uh, compared to somebody who's lent money to the business. All of which means that an investor, not a lender, an investor is interested primarily in four key, key issues. What is the upside potential of this business? absolutely fundamental. Um, there's a rather sort of disparaging uh, notion in, in, in venture capital that they don't invest in, in lifestyle businesses. Uh, and, and it sounds disparaging but, uh, and it gives a wrong impression because lifestyle businesses are the backbone of the British economy. You know, they employ a lot of people um, and they make a very good living for the people who, who are running those businesses. But lifestyle businesses are of no interest, generally speaking, to venture capitalists. They are looking for high growth opportunities where I can take this business from a million turnover to five million turnover in three years. That's how I make my money. So already you can sort of kind of see that there is a clear distinction between something which is a, a borrowing or lending proposal and something which is a, a, a venture capital proposal. If I'm looking to raise venture capital, I've got to have something really exciting. Otherwise, I'm not going to turn on... Um, you know, venture capitalists. You know, Julie was talking this morning, Ariadne Capital, you know, you could just see the profile of the businesses that, that she's investing in. You know, she's not investing in, you know, uh, corner shops and stuff like that. She's looking for the next big thing. That's, that's how they make it work. The next issue that I'm interested in is the upside potential commensurate with the risk. You know, and typically a VC might be looking to make five times their original, five to ten times their original investment within three to five years. That's going some. There are actually not a lot of businesses that can achieve that kind of return on investment for investors. They are the exception. They are not the rule. Um, you know, it will, venture capital is a niche form of finance. It is not a mainstream form of finance. And only the very um, high growth, um, exciting opportunities are going to turn a VC on. Um, so bear in mind that I'm looking for businesses that can go you know, stratospheric. I need to have the combina uh, confidence that the combination of management, technology, market dynamics, all, all that stuff is capable of delivering that return. So I'm really interested in who these people are, where they've come from, what their track record is. Do I trust them? Do I believe that they can take my £1 million and turn it into £4 million? So you know, an old venture capital saying is that I'm interested in three things, which is management, management, and management. Uh, because I know that a really good management team can actually make a fairly mediocre opportunity work very well. But likewise, a poor management team can screw up the best opportunity in the world. So as a VC, I'm very interested in, in uh, the management side of things. And the final thing is exit route. What is the exit route? If I buy 20% stake in a small local company, how do I get my money back? Because in 10 years' time, 20 years' time, I might still have a 20% stake in a small local company. I'm not interested in that. I need to see where the exit route is. And a VC might very well say, yes to that, yes to that, yes to that. Can't see it. Not interested. Unless I can see where the exit route is, 
then you know, why would I buy shares in a company that I could never sell again? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in what that exit route might be and how that could be um, contrived and, and planned. And, and, and there's got to be a, a, um, a sensible argument for that. I mean, just putting a, a final line in the end of your business plan saying, uh, and in five years' time we'll float on the stock exchange, is, is probably not enough. Um, most exits for VCs these days are through trade sales, um, occasionally selling to other VCs and that kind of thing. But you know, that, that needs to be um, thought through. So one of the things that, that, that comes out of all of this is that if you're looking to raise venture capital, your objectives have to align very closely with the objectives of a venture capitalist. If you want to run the business for the next 20 years, you may have a problem in that area. If your marketplace is stagnated and not growing, you may have a potential, uh, you may have a problem in that area. So it's a niche form of finance. It's not for everybody. Some equity examples. Well, I mentioned it earlier, profits, that's the best form of equity you can get. So if you've got a small business and you're looking to develop new products, if you can fund that from profits from other parts of your business, best way to do it. Cheapest form of fund funding and it's all yours. You don't have to sell any of your business to anybody else. Uh, your own money. Directors' uh, loans, often quasi-equity. Um, share capital, um, sweat equity to, to a certain extent as well, the, the time and effort that you put in. Uh, family and friends, yeah, for sure. Just be wary of this, the Financial Services Act. Um, I won't go into that in too much detail, but suffice to say, I, I can't take a business plan uh, this morning and give one to each of you and say, this is the best thing since sliced bread, um, give me £10,000, you can't go wrong. It's an illegal act. I could go to prison for it. It's called an unauthorised investment uh, advertisement, um, and you're not, you're not to do that. There are some exceptions. There are what's called sophisticated investors. Business angels typically would be sophisticated investors. People in certain professions like accountancy, law, that kind of thing. People with a certain amount of wealth and, and, and assets sit outside that. They would be classed as sophisticated investors. But generally speaking, you can't go around hawking your business plan to, 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 to Joe Public. That, you know, it's there to protect widows and orphans for obvious reasons, really. Um, an interesting thing is crowdsourcing. How does crowdsourcing sit within the Financial Services Act, which was drawn up 20 years ago or whatever, you know, pre-internet? Um, maybe some question marks about that. So I think the jury is out on, on precisely how crowdsourcing fits within the Financial Services Act. Um, other management team uh, members. Some crowdsourcing websites do offer um, equity investments as well. So a lot of it is built around debt. Um, but you can get some equity investments from, from certain crowdsourcing websites. Business Angels. The Business Angel um, network in Wales is called Xenos, X-E-N-O-S. Um, Xenos has several hundred members, um, and they club together and often do syndicated investments in, in, in companies. And the advantage of taking on a Business Angel as an investor is that they not only bring the cash, which is very welcome, they also bring... Um, expertise, networks, contacts, etc. So at a sort of early seed capital stage, which might be prior to going to, to institutional venture capital, business angels can be a really valuable source of, of early stage risk capital. Uh, venture capitalists, uh, um, venture capital trust, which is a, a mechanism that they use to, to make investments. Corporate venturing, really, really important um, uh, and and growing part of funding smaller businesses. And again, this was mentioned by both uh, Julie and, and Bruce Dickinson as a source of, of funding. Most big organizations, if they're outward looking anyway, will, will have a venture arm. So I came across uh, the other day General Motors Ventures, who are, who are looking to make investments in the automotive sector for obvious reasons. You know, Shell, BP, Google, Microsoft, they all have um, corporate venturing arms, where they're looking to... Pharmaceutical industry, big, big example where corporate venturing works really well, where they're looking to make uh, small investments, seed investments in a, in a wide variety of little companies with a view to them picking up the winners if, if they get traction in the marketplace. Um, so, so a very important uh, and emerging part and growing part of, of funding early stage businesses, and in certain sectors... It's one of the key ways in which the, these things work. And it's part of this whole issue of, 
of, of building these networks. And the big advantage, obviously, of, of a corporate venturing uh, in, investment, and, and here's an example of one, EADS. EADS have a, a foundation, which is like a corporate venturing arm. EADS own Airbus, based in Newport and up in, in North Wales as well. EADS have a massive technology footprint. You know, everything from, you know, uh, materials to electronics to software to seating systems, you know, et cetera, et cetera. If you get a bit of corporate venturing from EADS and, and your technology or, or your opportunity sits within, what, within their technology footprint, not only have you got the money, you've potentially got a route to market as well. You may even have your first customer. So corporate venturing, very important part of risk finance these days. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, you know, there, there are lots of places to, to find um, equity finance. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but Nesta, we've got a company on our high potential program that have raised uh, money from Nesta. Nesta it works out of the Cabinet Office in London, National Endowment for Science, Technologies and the Arts. We've got a company that's had a quarter of a million pounds from Nesta. Um, Finance Wales, um, hugely important funding mechanism for businesses in Wales. Uh, Finance Wales are wholly owned by the Welsh Government. Uh, they've raised a lot of money uh, through Europe and from some private investors as well. And they've got hundreds of millions of pounds available to, to lend and to invest in companies in Wales. And if you're looking to raise finance in Wales, I would certainly suggest that you really ought to be contacting Finance Wales to find out whether or not they can help you. Uh, UK Steel Enterprise, I've already mentioned this, operates in the former uh, steel making areas of Wales, of which this would be one, North East Wales is another as well. Small amounts of capital, so 20, 30, 40, 50k loan, maybe unsecured, maybe under the Enterprise Finance Guarantee Scheme, they do take, make equity investments as well. Uh, Westbridge Capital, based out at uh, Cardiff Gate, um, do management buyouts, that kind of thing. And if you want to find out more about venture capital uh, in general, then this website is a really useful resource. Uh, the British Venture Capital Association, um, you can join as a sort of registered member or something for about 100 quid, I think, and that gives you access to all of the members, you know, what stage of business they invest in, what localities they invest in, what kinds of industry sectors they invest in, so, and, and a whole host of really useful information about you know, why you would want to raise venture capital and how you go about it. The other thing which I didn't mention actually on uh, the BBA website is the BBA actually has on their website a little tool, interactive tool called Business Finance Finder and you can basically use that tool to identify sources of funding that are available to you in your region or locality. Okay, grants. Uh, another five minutes or so, and then we'll, we'll, we'll take some questions. So grant funding is, is characterised by the, 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 the following. It ten, tends to be non-repayable, although the Welsh Government does have some repayable grant schemes at the moment. Uh, it could be repayable if the grant's not used correctly, so there are always clawback arrangements. And, and they're primarily driven by this need to achieve non-financial outputs. So that could be job creation, it could be innovation, it could be exporting, it could be employing people. Uh, it could be environmental um, concerns and so on. Um, but the mindset of somebody who is giving out a grant is completely different to somebody who is lending money to a company or somebody who is investing money in a company. And if I'm giving out grants, I'm interested in this kind of stuff. Is the project eligible? Tick box. Will the project achieve the non-financial outputs that I'm interested in, whether it be that job creation or innovation or whatever it happens to be? Will it generate positive publicity. I'm very interested in positive publicity, but I really hate anything <coughs> negative. So I'm going to stay away from anything which I think could end up in a bad smell. Um, and finally, do we have the budget capacity available? Um, because what you tend to find with grant schemes is, you know, they may be oversubscribed, they may be undersubscribed, they may have money at certain times of year, not at other times of year. It's a question you need to ask up front. Do you have money available? If no, is it going to be available in three months time or whatever it happens to be? So some grant examples, and there are lots of business grants out there. Um, it does take some time to sort of think about you know, where, where they all are and take some research again. But they tend to be uh, based around these, these kind of things, you know, innovation, training, capital expenditure, academia and business collaboration, um, cross-border collaboration within the EU, that, that kind of thing. Um, 
we, we could have a whole day session just on grants, which obviously we don't have time to do today. Um, here are some examples of grant sources. Welsh Government have grants available, particularly for innovation and job creation. Uh, the Technology Strategy Board, based in Swindon, TSB. In Wales, we tend to think that the only grants that are available to us are grants that come from Wales. But actually, the TSB has a lot of money to spend, particularly on early stage technology businesses. Um, they are looking to fund companies that, that meet their, their um, uh, sector priorities. Um, the European Union provides a lot of grant funding to Wales. And there's something called the U Wales European Funding Office. Google that, you can find their website. Why is that of interest? Um, because basically, WEFO will tell you where all the money has gone. So you can look on the web WEFO website and you can see that they've just awarded you know, two million pounds to Pembrokeshire County Council to uh, work with you know, um, graduates, for example. I just made that up, by the way. But um, you know, that, that essentially, so rather than sort of being blinded by all these potential grant schemes, if you go to the top and follow the money down, you can find out where it's gone and contact the organization that is actually spending that grant money. It's a much simpler and easier way to do things. Um, private foundations, there are lots of private foundations. Again, Google private foundations, you'll get the um, Esme Fairburn Trust, the Robert Owen Foundation, the Wellcome Trust. These are all trusts that have been set up for philanthropic purposes, generally speaking, and they have a lot of money to invest. The Esme Fairburn Foundation has something like 140 million pounds under management, and they're looking to um, invest in projects w which have sort of social cohesion aspects to them and, and that kind of thing. Um, and also the Carbon Trust have, have some grants, I think, still available for environmental technologies. Okay, um, final slide. Um, we've talked a bit about the types of funding, borrowing, equity, grants. We've talked about some of the sources of borrowing, equity, and grants. I just want to have a quick word about what can fund what. It sounds a bit sort of a tautology in some ways. Um, but on the top here, on this little matrix, I've got borrowing, equity, and grants. And then on the left-hand side, I've got the main um, uh, applications of funding, if you like. And, and most funding requirements sit in one of these three areas. It's either working capital, i.e. cash flow variances, the acquisition of assets of one sort or another, or, or losses um, because you're starting a business and, you know, etc. So if we take borrowing, equity and grants, how does that fit against these, these three areas where, where money ends up, if you like? Um, can you borrow for working capital? Yes, you can. You can borrow from banks, uh, you know, invoice discounting. You borrow from your suppliers by way of you know, 30 days credit. Um, you, you, can, you can borrow generally for working capital, not for everything. You know, stock is much, more hard, much harder to borrow against than, for example, plant and machinery. But generally speaking, borrowing works quite well for, for working capital. But does borrowing work for asset acquisition? Yes, it does. So HP and leasing, you know, anything where you're buying a big chunky bit of kit, borrowing generally works quite well there. Uh, losses, no. If you go to a bank and you say, I need to, I need to borrow 100,000 pounds, and 50,000 of that is, is because I'm gonna lose money in the first year, the bank is not interested in funding losses. There's a general banking rule, which is, we don't lend money to cover losses. That's not what we do. Um, equity. Yeah, you could use equity for working capital, and when you start out, you might need to do that. It's quite an expensive way of doing it, so that's a maybe. Um, assets, yeah, you'd use equity to, to ask, acquire assets because you can't borrow 100% uh, from the borrow, borrowing side of things, so you might you know, put a bit of equity in to, to balance the, the borrowing that you've got. And losses, exactly, that is what equity is for, is there to, to cover early stage losses. Uh, grants. Working capital, generally not. I'm not aware of any grants that are available for working capital. Assets, yes. Grants are often used uh, as a, a, a subsidy towards the acquisition of assets of one sort or another. And yes, grants can be used to cover losses. So R&D grants are, are used effectively to, to cover the losses that you have to um, make in, in developing a new product or technology prior to getting out there in the marketplace. OK. So that, in a sense, is a quick canter through the main types of finance and the main sources of finance. Lots of them, it requires a lot of homework and a lot of thought. Um, you probably will need to take advice on doing this, but there is lots of advice out there. 
Well, it's, it, it, it's, it's certainly tricky in those circumstances. I think it would depend. Certainly borrowing would be harder to get. If you've got a poor, poor credit score, you've got very little track record, um, then, you know, if I'm lending money to you and I'm asking that first question, am I confident this person can repay the loan? Then, you know, I've got question marks over that. Having said that, to try and answer your question, I think there are places you could go. The Prince's Trust would be one. All ah, right, yeah, there are age restrictions. 30, I think it is, isn't it? Oh, 40 plus. There are other areas. For example, the um, uh, British Legion uh, lend money to ex-service uh, personnel, um, and I don't think there are any issues as far as that's concerned. One thing I would say, though, is that if, if I'm uh, uh, an equity investor, yes, I'd be interested in a person's background and experience and so on, but that wouldn't necessarily prevent me from buying into a, to a business just because somebody's got uh, an adverse credit rating, provided I felt that I could trust them and they had the capabilities to move forward. So what actually would be more uh, appropriate in those circumstances would probably be some kind of you know, business angel investment or something from one of these private trusts, private foundations like the Esme Fairburn Foundation or the Robert Owen Trust or something like that. So th I think the answer to your question is, yes, in those circumstances, you are much more restricted, but there are places that you could go, for sure. I, I think high street bank lending would be pretty much a no-no for you, but yes, it, it, yeah, I, I, and yeah, I think that's true. You know, I can't deny that reality. But, but I think there are other places to go. Private foundations would be one, uh, and equity investors would be the other. Well, it depends what you need the £2,000 for, but if it was working capital, then I'd just be thinking about, well, can you actually borrow that from your suppliers? Okay, so, so there are a number of schemes. Some local authorities will give, will, will give business rate reductions. So a lot of local authorities have little pockets of grant funding available. Uh, the Welsh Government has various schemes for taking graduates in particular um, in, into companies and subsidising their, their salaries for a period of... 10 or 12 weeks. Uh, you can find that through the Go Wales website. Uh, there's also a Welsh government back scheme which aims to help 16 to 24 year olds find employment. Uh, Business Growth Wales, I think it's called. Sorry? Biz Jobs Growth Wales. There we are. Ros at the back. Font of all knowledge. Uh, yeah, Jobs Growth Wales. That's a subsidy for taking on uh, unemployed people. Um, the, the, the one thing I would, I would do again on that is, is actually perhaps visit the WEFO website because there's quite a lot of money that's co come from the European Social Fund that's gone into exactly that kind of activity. Um, so, yeah, there, there are various things you can do. And there are also tax credits as well for doing R&D and, and, and that sort of thing as well. Okay, so business angel investment is, is, is obviously private individuals, sometimes working in a syndicate, but their kind of, you know, level of investment would typically be, certainly in Wales, 20, 30, 50, maybe 100,000 pounds, something like that. Having said that, we've got a company on our high potential program that's just raised 480,000 pounds from one individual, or, albeit a peer in the House of Lords. Um, uh, but, but that, you know, business angel funding is typically sub 100K uh, unless you're putting together a syndicate. VC money, um, a lot of VCs don't invest much less than a million pounds because they're looking for a small number of really good, good things. But there are funds that invest less than that. Finance Wales is one. So Finance Wales is typical sort of investment um, uh, target would be, you know, maybe 100K up to about a million, something like that. So, and, and then you've got crowdsourcing as well. So, so actually, if you looked back 10 years ago, at the funding landscape in Wales, and you were looking to raise small amounts, i.e. sub-million pound level of, of equity investment, you'd really be struggling. Now, you, you've got Xenos, the Business Angel Network, you've got Finance Wales that operate in that space, uh, you've got UK Steel Enterprise, although they were around 10 years ago, but critically, you've got crowdsourcing as well. Um, you know, they're all actually new things that didn't exist 10 or 15 years ago. Um, I mean, the reality is, you know, and again, not going to dodge the reality, the reality of most bank lending decisions are made by computers. Um, they are. Um, and, and they're based on very sophisticated algorithms that the banks have, you know, built up over many years of, of monitoring and, and analysing businesses in, in, in the UK. They, they essentially know, you know, the, the, the signs of danger, if you like. Um, it, it, it is very difficult 
for, for, for the average small business owner to break out of that, in a sense, you more or less have to accept that reality that ultimately the, the, the lending decisions are based on credit scoring of one sort or another. Now, there, there are the sort of um, investment side of, 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 of banks where they're looking to put, to put in unsecured lending and venture capital and so on, but you know, that's sort of million pound plus you know, levels, and there is a lot more discretion in that. They're operating more like a venture capitalist than, than, um, th than a traditional bank. But the reality is, if you're going to a bank for sec ordinary, boring, secured lending, the, the, the local manager does not have a lot of discretion. Okay, there's a couple of issues there. I mean, I don't want to get too embroiled in the, in the whole enterprise finance guarantee scheme because, because fundamentally the way that works is it, it is at the discretion of the bank. So the way in which it's been set up, the government doesn't have the ability to intervene in those local decisions. However, there is something now which the government is introducing called the funding for lending scheme. Um, and essentially, that is a scheme whereby the government is, is providing very, very cheap money to the banks, i.e. at half a percent interest. Uh, and they're lending that to the banks, but it comes with a catch. And the catch is, you, Mr. Bank, have to on-lend that to customers or we'll charge you a penalty interest rate. So I think some of those issues might start to ease up a bit. There's already evidence in the, in the private mortgage market that the funding for lending scheme is starting to have an impact. And I suspect that ultimately it will feed through into business lending as well. That the banks are more incentivized now to try and find good um, cash flow uh, based lending that they can, that they can get away. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's an issue. I mean, what, one of the things that you'll find is you can try and get your bank manager to sign a non-disclosure agreement. But, but a, lot, yeah, a lot of bank managers will be extremely reluctant to do that. Their corporate policy won't allow them to do it. Um, I think the point was probably made in the other room. You know, the reality is, is that it, it is a basic business risk. You know, that if you are exposing your ideas for the purpose of raising finance, that is a risk that you probably have to take. You can mitigate it in some ways. Patents is one, design rights and trademarks are others, <coughs> non-disclosure agreements are others, but you cannot get rid of that risk completely. If you are asking other people to put money into your venture, you've got to tell them what it is. Uh,